Nearly 10 days after Taiwan's huge quake, thousands are still left without a home. Taiwan's next leaders. The incoming premier reveals more of the next cabinet. Three the crowd, US, Japan, and the Philippines hold an unprecedented summit. Plus, no longer lost in translations, a new app built to save Taiwanese Hokkien. Welcome to Taiwan Plus News, I'm Yvonne Yang. Rescue teams are stepping up the search for the three people still missing over a week since a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck Hualien. One worker is believed to be trapped five stories below ground in a mine in New Taipei. Heavy machinery is trying to reach the area, but reports suggest they may not have survived. Meanwhile, search teams have identified a section of mountain trail outside of Hualien where they believe two missing Singaporeans may be. 128 buildings were damaged in last week's earthquake in Hualien, leaving residents with nowhere to go. John Van Trieste has this report. We'll see. This 17-story apartment block in Hualien withstood last week's earthquake, but not without heavy damage. The concrete walls are punched full of holes and riddled with cracks, and debris covers the floors. Inspectors say the building can be repaired, but for now, the nearly 400 residents must find somewhere else to live. Over a week after the earthquake, most still don't have a long-term plan. Mm. This is just one of 128 buildings across Taiwan that either need repairs or are set for demolition after the earthquake in Hualien. Many are residential. The government has come up with a financial support scheme to help displaced people. It will offer up to 47,000 U.S. dollars to cover repairs and up to 109,000 to cover interest on loans for housing that needs reconstruction. And there's funding to cover the rent in a new place while people wait for repairs or rebuilding, up to 560 a month. But in Hualien especially, there are those who'd rather risk aftershocks and stay put in their damaged homes. With many people suddenly needing an apartment in this city of just 100,000, vacancies, especially reasonably priced ones, are in short supply. One other suggestion has been temporary prefabricated housing, the kind that can be put up and taken down again. Some say this might not be a bad idea, considering the scale of destruction. But will this housing be close to where people work and go to school? How will it be set up? As engineers take stock of the scale of the demolition and repair work that needs to be done, officials are sizing up the human cost and figuring out how to help survivors through the weeks and months ahead. James Lin and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's incoming premier, Zhu Rongtai, has revealed his picks for five of the country's next cabinet ministers. Our reporter Leslie Liao was on location for the announcement. Two days after Taiwan President-elect Lai Qingde announced his pick for Taiwan's next premier, Zhu Rongtai, Zhu today announced five of Taiwan's next cabinet ministers. First, we have Liu Sifang, who's been tapped as Taiwan's next interior minister. Liu is a former deputy mayor of Kaohsiung City in southern Taiwan. She's also been a legislator, and she's also been the secretary general of the cabinet. However, she's probably best known for overseeing disaster relief efforts after a gas explosion in Kaohsiung City in 2014. Taiwan's current cabinet secretary general, Li Mengyan, will be Taiwan's next transport minister. Now, when announcing his appointment, Zhuo pointed out that Li has a background in environmental engineering, and Li has been tasked with developing Taiwan's infrastructure with an emphasis on offsetting the negative impacts of climate change. 
Taiwan's next justice minister will be Zhen Mingqian, who is currently Taipei City's chief prosecutor. Taiwan's next education minister is Zhen Yingyao, who is the current president of National Sun Yat-sen University in southern Taiwan. When announcing his appointment, Zhuo says that Zheng has years of experience developing bilingual education and raising uh, student competitiveness, which has been an emphasis point for the ruling DPP administration over the years. Finally, Zhuo announced that Taiwan's next culture minister will be writer and screenwriter Li Yuan, better known by his pen name Xiao Ye. What's interesting is Li was an aide to former Taipei City Mayor Ke Wenzhe, who now chairs the opposition Taiwan People's Party. However, Zhuo seemed confident in Li's ability to help develop Taiwan's culture, uh, whether it be local culture, industrial culture, and make that a bright spot on the international stage. There remains about 10 cabinet positions that have yet to be announced. The cabinet spokesperson told Taiwan Plus earlier that there are two to three more cabinet minister position announcement events like these in the works. Uh, still yet to be announced are vital arms of government like the ministers for the Foreign Affairs Ministry and the Defense Ministry. Justin Wu and Leslie Liao in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. The U.S., Japan and the Philippines have wrapped up an unprecedented trilateral meet summit with Washington saying its defense commitments to the other two countries are ironclad. Hamil Khan reports. A historic meeting just concluded. Leaders from the U.S., Japan and the Philippines are in Washington, D.C., seeking to strengthen security ties in the Indo-Pacific region. It's the first such summit between the three countries. And Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. says their relationship is bound by a common goal. We meet today as friends and partners bound by a shared vision and pursuit of a peaceful, stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific. It is a partnership born not out of convenience nor of expediency, but as a natural progression of a deepening relation and robust cooperation amongst our three countries. The summit comes as the Philippines struggles to confront China's increasingly aggressive actions in the South China Sea, a massive body of water that sees more than a third of all global trade pass through this channel. The Philippines is one of several countries with territorial claims in the region, with China saying nearly the entire sea belongs to it. But Beijing's claim was rejected by an international court ruling in 2016. China has since increased its presence in the area, recently blasting water cannons to drive out Philippine boats and injuring some of the crew. It's this escalation that is drawing concern from the U.S. And I want to be clear, the United States, the United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They're ironclad. As I've said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. With wars continuing to rage in Gaza and Ukraine, the U.S. is leaning on its Asia-Pacific allies to help deter China from disrupting regional peace and security. Speaking before the trilateral summit, Kishida was the second Japanese prime minister to ever address the U.S. Congress. He told lawmakers that Japan is ready to step up to help safeguard the current international order. I understand it is a heavy burden to carry such hopes on your shoulders. Although the world looks to you, your leadership, the U.S. should not be ex expected to do it all, unaided and on your own. Japan has already pledged to conduct joint Coast Guard patrols with the Philippines in the South China Sea. Officials also say that this summit is the first of planned regular meetings. Analysts in Washington say the three countries are showing willingness to promote collective security. The defense environment in Asia will constantly be changing, so we should always continue to have those discussions. But what we can commit to right now and confirm, I think, for the long term is uh, the messaging around the, the, the strength of, uh, and resiliency of our, of our alliances, partnerships, and friendships.
As the three leaders wrap up this historic meeting, they'll be looking to put words into action and band together in managing one of the world's hottest flashpoints. Andy Shre and Jaime Ocon for Taiwan Plus. And to find out more about the wider implications for the summit, Jaime Ocon spoke to Riley Walters, a security analyst with Hudson Institute based in Washington, D.C. So, Riley, I want to first start off with your immediate reaction and also just Japan's presence at both the bilateral and trilateral summit. What are your takeaways from this summit? So starting from the trilateral, I think it does represent a, a next step in Japan's evolving security interests. Um, you know, I think this trilateral is actually very much an echo of last year's uh, Camp David summit between the leaders of the U.S., Japan, and South Korea, where uh, it was really, you know, trying to not just, uh, you know, resolve historical issues, but you know, build these new uh, trilateral alliances within the region. And so the Philippines, I think, is, is the next step. And it definitely echoes Japan's interest in, as, as they've said, becoming a global partner for the United States, going at it, you know, uh, shoulder to shoulder, really, um, you know, as much as they can. And so uh, I think the Philippines has been a clear uh, potential partner uh, since even last year. Uh, I know a lot of uh, some officials were talking about including the Philippines last year. And so um, this is really that next step. And going forwards in terms of security cooperation in the South China Sea, what are we going to see and what can we expect, given the fact that a lot of analysts are now saying that the South China Sea could be even more of a flashpoint than the Taiwan Strait? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, know, you see these videos online of the Chinese Coast Guard just blasting uh, their water cannons and, and doing real damage uh, to Philippine Coast Guards and, and ships. And so... Uh, there's definitely, I think, a lot more action going on in the South China Sea. And so, yes, it, it does get a lot more attention. And uh, that's why I think in the uh, the joint statement, the joint uh, vision that we just saw released from the White House between the United States, Japan and, and Philippines is, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot more, I think, close partnership, a lot more training and coordinating uh, their Coast Guard efforts and and of course, uh, reaffirming America's commitment to, to the, the alliance with the Philippines as well. What does the future of all this mean, though? I, mean, it's, I think it's still up in the air. And looking at the trilateral summit as a whole, the first time that the Philippines and Japan are in D.C. together, was this summit a success in the sense of achieving the goals that both all three leaders wanted to accomplish at the summit? I think that it definitely uh, achieved a lot of what, uh, you know, Kishida wanted, um, you know, time will tell really though, it, because this, this message isn't so much about um, uh, confirming the alliance. I think, I think when you talk to people in Washington, there's already so much support for the alliance. I mean, every Japan expert in Washington, I think over the last couple of months has talked about the importance of this trip, because Japan is such a strong uh, ally and partner, uh, the the real test, I think, is over uh, the next uh, year, maybe two years, to see whether that messaging really resonates more with the people of Japan and the people of America. That was Riley Walters, a security analyst from the Hudson Institute, speaking to our reporter Jaime Ocon. The U.S., South Korea, and Japan have concluded two days of joint naval exercises near the Korean Peninsula. The drills involved a U.S. carrier strike group and Japanese and South Korean warships. They were aimed at ensuring readiness against nuclear and missile threats from North Korea. A Portuguese Hong Kong dual citizen has been sentenced to five years in prison under the city's national security law. The defendant, Joseph John, pled guilty to charges of conspiring inside secession for posts he made on social media. John managed social media accounts for a small Hong Kong pro-independence party based in the UK. He was detained for more than 16 months without bail and was denied a plea bargain. This is the first time a dual citizen has been convicted of national security crimes in Hong Kong. Coming up, a new generation takes up a dying art of lion dancing, but would it be a roaring success? Find out after the break. In the face of adversity, the power of truth. 
A roadmap for a just and open world, charted by the freest country in Asia. Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan Plus News, a voice of freedom in Asia. For the biggest stories in tech, business, and more, be sure to follow Taiwan Plus on social media. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. People are fleeing to Thailand after Myanmar's ruling junta lost control of a key border town. Thailand has boosted security at the border near Miawadi. Anti-Junta forces ousted about 200 Myanmar army soldiers from the town. It's the latest defeat facing the junta as armed opposition to their rule gains ground across the country. To find out more about the recent military developments in Myanmar and what it means for the country's people, our reporter Rick Glower spoke to Myanmar journalist in exile, Mo Mient. So what does this loss of a major Myanmar-Thailand border town mean for the ruling hunter? I think after China, Thailand is the, the biggest uh, uh, border trade. So in that, Miaudi is the only place that, um, you know, connect with Thai border, Mae South. And uh, all the trades come in that routine, uh, you know, either that can be illegal or legal, either one. So one of the battalions, uh, you know, uh, fled or, you know, uh, surrender. So if the uh, revolutionary groups are able to control uh, the entire Miaudi routine, that's going to be a huge blow for the military hunter because they already lost China border trade, especially uh, in northern Myanmar state. And how much control do the generals have over the country as a whole? So I think heavy losses, obviously in, in Karenni state and then Nordishan state, and then many battalions are also, um, the Honda also lose many battalions in um, Kachin area. So every major uh, backbone of the economy is, is gone. So if the military is not financially able to secure, if they're not financially very strong, how can they buy um, sophisticated advanced military weapons to retaliate uh, the revolutionary groups? So that's not possible. The United Nations has flagged the dire economic situation in Myanmar. Could you tell us what life is like for the people living there? So um, the people, the majority of the population were kind of relying on, on the commodities that come from Rangoon. So uh, they no longer have access to food. So what uh, in, in rural area, what people do is that they uh, forage fruits and vegetables in the forest, but the military plants uh, landmines uh, everywhere. So a lot of people lose land. In certain area, for instance, uh, Yango and Mandalay, they do not suffer like that because they have uh, access to food. And they, yeah, well, the, the big difference is you have food, the other place, they don't have food. That was Miramar journalist Momi Int talking to Rick Glower. A chief surgeon and hospital dean in Kaohsiung had been fired after a surgery was performed on the wrong patient. Four hospital workers were also punished for involvement in the incorrect surgery. The hospital says a worker failed to identify the patient before transferring him to the operating room. Only after the surgery did another nurse notice the wrong patient had been taken. The doctor who performed the surgery was also reported to have forged the patient's medical consent forms. The hospital has been fined 15,000 US dollars over the incident. Taiwanese Hokkien used to be the primary language here in Taiwan, but the language is gradually fading with the rise of Mandarin Chinese. In the US, a college student has built her own app to pass the language down and more importantly, to keep in touch with her grandparents. Joyson has this story. Me. A digital tool that translates English to Taiwanese Hokkien, invented by Taiwanese American engineering student Talia Huang. Born in California, Huang grew up trilingual in English, Mandarin, and Taiwanese Hokkien, commonly known as just Taiwanese. 
distinct from Mandarin, Taiwanese is the only language Huang has in common with her grandparents. Now a college student far from home, Huang worries she's losing this tie to her family. I spoke English as my most native language, while Taiwanese was just spoken with my parents and grandparents. So after not practicing for so long, I realized that I needed to create some way that could help me kind of keep up my Taiwanese language. Huang tapped into her coding skills and created BobaWay, a program that takes English text, translates it into Chinese, as that's the closest written language to Taiwanese, and finally gives a romanized pronouncer. Though still widely spoken among people in Taiwan, the Taiwanese language has been losing its prevalence. Linguists say this is in part due to Mandarin's significance on both the local and global stage. If people want to keep Taiwanese alive, they need to make a concerted effort to do so because it's not the language of commerce or power, especially with China's enormous global influence. It's a language spoken more by the older generation than by the younger, which means there's intergenerational language loss as our elders pass on. So it's particularly important that parents and grandparents pass their language down while they still can, especially at home, which is the most important domain for um, intergenerational language transmission or transfer. Aside from connecting with home, for Huang, she says fluency in Taiwanese is a big part of her identity. Living outside of Taiwan, she's even more motivated to share her language with others. Taiwanese has always been a spoken language and so creating like a written like a romanization is sort of kind of like westernization a bit it sort of loses the original tradition but I do think that romanization also does help with learning a language especially for foreigners who are trying to learn Taiwanese Huang says she has more ideas for her app melding her coding and linguistic skills to give an accessible digital push to preserve a language that's such a big part of Taiwanese identity. Eason Chen, Eric Tai, and Joyce Zen for Taiwan Plus. Traditional performances need to be passed down to survive, but there are very few practitioners of the Hakka Lion Dance left in Taiwan. Our reporter said she meets one of the last old masters. Not the seventh Chinese lion dance you usually see at festivals. This is the traditional Hakka lion dance. This art form is also from China, but here in Taiwan, it's on the verge of disappearing. To keep this tradition alive, Liu Wenzhen, one of the last Hakka masters in northern Taiwan, is doing his best to train new Hakka lion performers of all ages. Despite decades of dedication to the tradition, for Master Liu, passing on his art is still a challenge. The Hakka Lion dance was banned during the Japanese colonial era because it was considered a form of martial art. Performers were forced to train in secret, leading to a drop in the number of practitioners. Today, those who still practice it are mainly from the older generations. <laughs> There aren't many chances to perform this vanishing art form, so Master Liu's apprentices train for fun. A major feat considering how hard it is. Many say that the Hakka Lion Hit is very difficult to perform with. It requires a lot of strength to control and one can weigh up to 24 kilograms. According to Masa Liu, the most challenging part is to be able to hold up throughout the performance. To address the weight issue, Masa Liu developed smaller, lighter Hakka Lion Hits, making it easier for both younger and older people to handle. The smaller version can weigh just a few kilograms. And his innovation has been a big help for his younger students from high schools around Taoyuan in northern Taiwan.
刚好也是客家人，然后对啊，啊，又看到看到学校这个社团，就蛮有兴趣的。我是石头，然后因为那个平常也不会去接触这个，看那个别人表演才发现其实蛮蛮累的，还挺喜欢的。Master Liu has been working with schools for over a decade, but only a few started Hakka Lion Dance Clubs, making it challenging for Liu to pass down his skills to the next generation. 我们一个人的力量哦，真的要要推广，真的也很难呐哦。我们现在就说希望落实到学校去了。如果我们的政府哈对这个汉族文化有可以把那个呃经费哈补一点给学校哈，让学校来来推这个客家诗有没有啊？我们现在这你你政府不重视我们，好这个老师傅来帮你们推啊，到我们走了以后，真的就会断层掉了，客家诗就没有就会没有了。所以我感觉到我的使命啊，就希望客家诗延续下去。With a profound sense of responsibility for the tradition, Master Liu hopes teaching the Hakka lion dance will ensure future generations also take up the mantle. Kamashu, Klein Wong, and Sani Chi for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. You can visit the Taiwan Plus website or follow our social media for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Now, before we go, take a glimpse at the underwater world of the Philippines. I'm Yvonne Yang. Take care, and I'll see you next time.